the tin responds to all of the dirt. Like it basically flows around whatever's on here. So if there's like oil or dirt or something, then the tin doesn't go there. So then when you silver it, the silvering doesn't go there. So it's like the necessary grimy step. And then we should be pretty much ready. So actually what matters is the amount of tin that gets onto the glass. It's how we can control whether it's opaque or transparent. So at the very end I mix these together and then spray it and it just takes like 10 seconds of them mixing and then they basically are starting to respond and then you spray it on the glass that has the tin on it, which is in here. Um, and then they actually react with this. So you just have to keep them separate. They basically all go together on the glass. We were working with mirrored glass uh, in two different ways, trying to actually work with it as a material, but um, to work with it, also looking at what we could do in optical distortions. So a simultaneous discovery back and forth with material manipulation as well as optical manipulation. We noticed as we took pieces out of the kiln, they would reflect, and then we actually strategically used the light with specimen to reflect. And I think that's what gave us the jump then to say, okay, if we actually mirrored it, so it's not just entirely transparent, if we mirrored it, we would get one extra step of having a relationship, not just to the light, but to the rest of the context that the piece is placed in. The geometries that would first be water jet cut were very rigorous to all of those conditions and then the falling actually is something that in a way starts to happen by chance but you begin to develop its physical language where you know if we were to cut an extra shape we would get two small legs that would hit the ground first and then it would curl under and therefore it'd be more stable sitting on itself first if we never wanted it to fall for some of our later pieces now where they're actually doubling over one another. We could control it not hitting the bed. We could attempt to simulate it as a surface, but because the material thickness and the, and the mass, mm. you can't really easily simulate the, I guess what you'd call like a viscosity effect as the glass flows, as it's pulling down, and mm -hmm. this is all happening across a pretty quick span of just a few minutes at that temperature. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, a window where we can basically see into the process, but it's really too late to make any adjustments. So there's always this slightly longer feedback loop to, mm -hmm. to where you learn. There's an important step that happened too with the um, doing the, the photo capture because you, you would not see the same analog subtleties mm -hmm. if you try to do this digitally. I mean, these images look like maybe they're inspired by computer generated graphic but I think when you look closely you can definitely tell it's, it's an analog process that's literally light reflecting and, and bending um, that gives it kind of a richness that I don't think would happen in the, the digital you know print yeah. you know typically we think of glazing materials and, and surfaces you know, at least in architecture, not not so much for reflection. I mean, car design, mm. completely different field. Right. It's all about reflection. Then this idea of bringing curved and double curved glass into kind of the architect's toolkit in a, in a new way. And I think this is a medium to understand reflectivity in a, in a new way for mm. us.